So, uh, Meg, why don't you introduce what's happening since you, you are so instrumental to having organized. Does everybody here know Meg Tainter? Yeah. 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 Three of you who don't, I'm Meg. Uh, I'm the student engagement coordinator here. And we were just had this amazingly lucky thing where we had um, double edge in residency for one day while Culture Flash was in town. And sort of having this wealth of ensemble theater practice and uh, cultural theater practice and political theater practice all in the the building for this time, we thought, well, let's get them together and then let's just Shanghai Christina and have her come in and lead the conversation. So I'm going to, I've given a, a couple of questions to Christina, but I feel like let's take it away and start the conversation now. Thank you so much, Meg. Um, so uh, I am Christina Marin and I am an assistant professor of performing arts here at Emerson, uh, specifically in theater education, um, but also teach uh, in sort of some dramas like human rights in theater, theater of the oppressed, um, which gives me sort of the pleasure of having this be the focus of a lot of my, uh, what these um, wonderful people do, the focus of a lot of my research and work. Um, and so I just want to sort of turn over to them um, and have each of the companies sort of just give you a, a brief background that some of you are unfamiliar with the context of their work, um, length, where, um, where did it start, and that. And then I have some specific questions. Oh. Hola! <laughs> <laughs> Dramatically late. Fashionably late. <laughs> Settled people, so. He is around. I'm down. Sorry. Sorry. You're not well, and, and also maybe we should just have everyone go down the line first and say who they are and the company that they're with. We have Double Edge and Culture Clash, but I don't I, I'm really excited about this thing about groups, you know, that you form. I actually have decided we need to. Yeah, can we not sit Double Edge and Culture Clash? Can we intern <laughs> first? We Wait a minute, them. this is a yes man. <laughs> 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 we're gonna arm wrestle. This is a theater exercise. Switch chairs. We had a we had a color code. This is a dead match. It is a dialogue. It's been a long time. I want to sit next to the drummer. Okay. Right. Well, yeah. There you go. Um. So. I'll sit there. Dog nine. Now we'll start with Herbert, who will introduce himself, and now they're all intermixed, so tell us which one you're with. Uh, I'm Herbert Seguenza. I'm the co-founder, one of the co-founders of Culture Clash. It started in 1984, San Francisco. And that's all I'll say for now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> Great. I'm Stacy Klein, and I'm the founder of Double Edge 1982 in Boston. Uh, Matthew Glassman, I'm one of the co-artistic directors of Double Edge Theater, and I've been with the group for about 15 years. Uh, Rick Salinas with Culture Flash since uh, 1984. Carlos Uriana uh, with Double Edge Theater since 1996. Akiba Montoya. <laughs> 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 gonna be my new stage name. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Co-founder with The Boys, CC, San Francisco, 84. Otherwise known as Richard. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is our... Our discussion panel, um, I feel like it's weird that it's a panel, it's like a discussion sort of culture circle. Um, can we talk a little bit about the, the beginnings? The beginnings of Double Edge, the beginnings of Culture Flash. Whoever wants to start. <laughs> well, I, the, the, in 1984, uh, San Francisco was an interesting uh, place. Uh, I'm sure David remembers, but it, you know there was performance art hotels in South of Market. There was galleries. There was stand-up comedy clubs throughout all the suburbs. Um, there were some really great stand-up comedy clubs uh, in the city itself. Holy City Zoo. I mean, Robin Williams was just starting. Um, it was kind of an exciting, weird time. And then we're born in an art gallery. But um, I had worked an entire year with Renee Yanez, who was um, a curator of that gallery, really godfather of Chicano curators in San Francisco. We worked an entire year and a half prior to uh, Cinco de Mayo, our, our, our birth date, um, and we had just failed all over the place with this hybrid mix of theater, stand-up, performance, art. I remember doing skits with Diane Rodriguez. Stages? Uh, was it called Stages? Uh, stages was one of them, but we were, we had... We did Stanford. We got ran of Palo. We got ran out of Palo Alto. I remember doing a show with you, just me and you, and then Marga Gomez and Monica Palacios. 
Then Rick was added to the mix. Rick was uh, uh, rapping bilingually already. We were a heady mix of six people, and um, it wasn't pretty, you know. And um, what I remember today in 84 was there were civil wars going on in El Salvador and Nicaragua at that time, meeting with Proyecto Caigo Carito. Today, a lot of those folks remember those civil climate, wars. Yeah. It was no time for clowns, you know. But there we came, entering stage left and right, and um, not even knowing what stage right and left were. But, ha but grew up, grew up uh, looking at other heavy groups like yeah, San Francisco we, Mind Troop, Teatro Campesino. Yeah. Those are the, the ones that informed Yeah, us. yeah, we came, we kind of came at it. Uh, but those groups were very kind of serious. Very still. serious. Yeah. And the Chicano movement was still pretty, pretty serious. And I just remember like really pissing people off, like in Berkeley. And, <laughs> That group must not, you know, last, you know, and it's, it's, I remember just hearing board of directors saying, those guys upset everybody, and, and, um, I don't know what the tenacious, um, um, element of staying together, but it has something to do, I think, with coming out of, you know, broken families and all these things will come from, but we've managed to keep it together since 84, but it was a heady time in San Francisco, it was, uh, not a light period. And we came in doing, you know, resurrecting Che Guevara and, and doing uh, Prince and the Revolution and mixing it up like that, like right out of the gate. And people were just like, oh, but um, remember just in the, in the pop culture of times, because we, we did borrow from that, it was when MTV first started. Mm -hmm. The group Culture Club with Boy George was around. Um, the 80s was, was that crazy time where you had the music. The beginning of video. You know, and video was more so what, well, we were able to latch on as young men in our mid-20s. We latched onto that MTV reality at the time in stage and in theater, which meant that we grabbed music, we grabbed visual elements that were very, like, high contrast, very performance art, and musically, you know? So it, it changed the way we did theater versus the way that teatro was doing it. And at that time, theater was teatro, all the universities, in the Southwest had these teatros, which were theaters made up of students, faculty, and they would do political theater. Very dogmatic, very righteous, and, 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 and for that reason, a good reason, because they were talking about civil rights, about identity, and we took that, and for some strange reason, the way we grew up watching TV and being part of Broken Families, we just took it into another kind of a level, another um, point of view. So the 70s were about 80 theatros. So that's what I wanted to ask you is like, how many groups are there left? Really, like ensembles, people that are writer performers, you know, ensembles and groups. There's very little left in the United Well, States. they have had the longevity that, that these two groups have had. Um, yeah, I mean, there are but some that crop up and then they. But I think they cropped up more back then yes. than now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's what I mean. and, and double edge. I would think. We, I would think differently than that because I think there's a re-emergence now of groups mm -hmm. cropping up and they're get, coming back to being more place-related than they have been for the last maybe 20 years or something where they're cropping up outside of New York and about their communities oh, nice. and related to their culture. And I think a lot of that too, like there are more programs around the country too that are focused on applied theater rather than tr traditional and this kind of idea of devising work and idea of physical work. Um, also, I think a lot more are cropping up now, but again, like the, the longevity that there, that exists with these two groups, I think, um, I, I don't, you know, that like the, um, I think it's something to point out though, the three of us at least are not, we don't come from a the academic right. theatrical, right. so we, we should discuss that too. Like, how Absolutely. does that affect our work yeah. by not knowing anything? You know what I'm saying? Which and, is and liberating, which is really liberating and free, to, free for us to do our own. Right, but it's a different, it's a different kind of knowledge too. It's yeah, sort of yeah. like, it, and it might be more limiting to be in the academic setting than have the freedoms yeah. that you know yeah, that's yeah. what we talked about last night. But you all don't always have dental and medical. That's true. <laughs> a lot of freedom. Whether to, have, whether to have a stage or not a home. Or we not. should get back to double edge. Right, right. Like, yeah, learn, like you just mentioned learn. the home, like uh, the farm. No, I want to talk to her home. <laughs> <laughs> We're having a conversation. But, let's talk about the history of, um, of double edge. Uh, okay, well, we um, were founded in under two different strains of ideas, I think. One was that we were training based and 
that training came from my work in, in Poland with Brzozowski's Theater and also um, was continued with um, Rena Maretska, who was um, Brzozowski's founding actress. And um, I worked with her in the 70s and kept training. And the other was um, a, a, the idea of having a feminist theater in Boston. Um, and so I was trying to figure out how to put those two things together that didn't go together at all. Um, and um, I think it really started going together when we got a space in Boston, in Alston, the Church of St. Luke's and Margaret, and we were able to train every day and devise work and um, started like finding out how to apply our cultures and our, our gender and all of that stuff into our training. Really, I was going to school at Tufts, and um, they, there were no women involved in that schooling of mine uh, in 1980. Um, and I had just come from making um, two women's theater festivals in 1979 and 80, and I was like, oh, I just got dropped in the middle of Mars. For people not what women are. So, <laughs> um, so we made this performance with all women, and uh, we made the men sit up in the balcony, and people were outraged, so we thought we should start a theater. Um, so we did. And I think. Um, that's still important to us, but also everybody's culture and identity is important to us. Um, now in our company, it's very identity-based, our work. And um, I would say one more important thing happened to our identity, I mean, hugely important. After we decided we couldn't deal with Boston anymore, we moved to a farm in Ashfield create our work there and tour, um, and and people there thought we were maybe like kind of a cult because <laughs> we weren't performing, and that wasn't theater, so we started um, performing. So we have since engaged very strongly and become really integrated and interested in how to create a live culture with um, our community and any community where we work. And I think that's kind of why we were really excited about this conversation, because um, I think we're all trying to do stuff like that. Um, and then Carlos came right after we moved to Ashfield, and he was sort of instrumental in that community work and idea, having worked on the streets of um, a pretty dangerous Argentina at the time. So, like, understanding how that community and politics and culture could uh, move together. The origins in, in Buenos Aires, when I started in Buenos Aires, is very similar to what you're describing. And uh, the, the, the violence was more institutionalized. Uh, Constant that for San Francisco, the, the violence, you know, is random somehow. I mean, there, there are patterns, but still, there's a certain element of randomness in, in, in this other thing. When we were performing, normally we were performing. The shootings were happening. We're, sometimes. we're deliberate, you're saying that. No, no. Well, I remember yeah. Roberto Vargas, a uh, poet in San Francisco, yeah. was uh, attache to Nicaragua. There were safe houses, you know, in San Francisco. Uh, there were things going on. The, the, the closest thing later would become the act of SF uh, safe houses. And, but, but this this activism that, that yeah. was alive, not as dangerous as the streets of Buenos Aires, clearly. But uh, Chilenos in Berkeley. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, and it was in Chile too, like it was in, in Uruguay and Brazil and Paraguay. The, 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 this is a period that, that goes from roughly 74 through 83, mostly, and then starts to. That in, in 
and whether taper off. Taper off. Like the snow. Bird. It's yeah. interesting that both groups uh, come out of explosive times, and we reviled other groups of people. <laughs> people were well, but they didn't like us. Both at some something time. interesting. Like I was very committed and very militant, and when I arrived to the U.S. by the end of the '80s for the first time with this group that I was working, with, still there in Argentina, the Diablo Mundo, and we did a lot of puppet work, and we were in a lot of places in, in the U.S. and in Europe. Uh, when we arrived here, and also the feeling is that after the big repression, so the, the social movements in the 60s, like Pedro Campesino, they were pretty big. But then when, when you land at the, the 80s, my memory, or my, my recollection of the 80s and the 90s, it was like, you know, you're stuck in the 60s, man. This, is, this didn't happen. We're in a different world now. There's all this big economics, and, mm -hmm. and like nothing is happening. Everything is fine. Go to the neighborhoods, go to, go to San Francisco. And I would go and say, nothing is fine. What are they talking about? <laughs> and, and, and that's how I recall the 80s, when we were developing these groups. Like, uh, uh, being, feeling, you know, you were, say, you, you said you felt like a Martian uh, because of what was going on with women. But I also felt like a Martian because I was talking about something. I said, that's a conspiracy theory. The corporations are not against us. What are you talking about? That was the feeling, like, oh, Actually, I thought they were Martians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the real person. <laughs> oh, no, I thought I was Martian. <laughs> well, so, so let's, let's maybe talk about this. So, so both companies, I guess, can be seen as companies that creatively respond to injustice, to ideas of, um, to, to political ideas, and how, how do you see the work um, as creative response to injustice, to forms of um, destruction in a way? Well, like Herbert was saying, um, being outsiders, we were a group that, in a sense, were not in, under academic or even a, a central theater company. We were pretty autonomous mm -hmm. in the side space. And, and we decided to do that just by accident, really, because um, you know we weren't getting grants, we weren't getting any monies to do what we did. We did apply to, at that era though, in the 80s, 90s, there were there was more money for the arts than now, but we got money from the California Arts Council, you know, grants here and there, but we would take that and, um, you know, create our work, but sometimes, um, an example I could give you is during the uh, uprisings, uh, Rodney King in Los Angeles, you know, we felt like Okay, we couldn't wait to write the grant to do a piece on this because it would take six months later, and so we a just did it. Riot, you, know. you know, so we we just took it upon ourselves to, to write a play called SOS. You know, you know SOS because we saw we were there coming from San Francisco and oh, Los yeah, Angeles, LA was, and it was right. I mean, it was fires and the Rodney King, and we were right there in the, in the nest of that. So we decided to put up a show, and we did a whole play on that, and. The reason I'm bringing that up is sometimes you can't wait. You just got to do it. And that one was a political piece. I mean, we, you know, we, you know, we we tell some truths in our material. And one of them, I'll never forget. We had a Salvadorian family. Herbert played Doña Flora. He played my son. I was a Nicaraguense father. You know, we were in the. We we had been you know escaping the war of Salvador, and we come to L.A. and there's a war in the streets because of running. But um, you know. Herbert's character would say, well, when you go outside, cuidado con los negros. Be careful of the blacks, right? And I remember Latinos coming up to me saying, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? You're going to just divide us again, you know? And I go, well, it's true. There's people that are afraid of blacks. And this family, this uh, economic, you know, sense of, of, of who you are when you move as an immigrant, it's a reality. So we put it out there. And, you know, we put the play out there. So that was an example of, like. And it motivates the dialogue. Yeah. After I saw also the, the, your performance, which was fantastic, I was exercising my memory a little bit, which is kind of like feeble sometimes <laughs> and, uh, at some age. Uh, and um, one of the things that, that happened to me was that, you know, I was very committed and very involved in, in all these movements. And, and, and at some point, when, they, when the, the, the thing 
broke loose, we were encouraged to get weapons and you know organize ourselves with weapons. And one of my first thoughts was like, you know, I did the simple equation. I mean, if we're fighting these guys and, and these guys um, are supported by the U.S., <laughs> I don't think we have a chance. I mean, how much, how much weaponry do you need to beat the nukes? You know, like, I'm, you're not going to get a nuke. So the mathematic didn't work for me. And I was like, you know, there's no fiber power that could, you know, if there's no organization on fire power that's going to give us any chance with these guys. So. One of the first things we thought as groups was, you know, the, the way out is, is culture and education. And, and that was, I'm telling you, this, all these kids, and we were a vast group, we started thinking this is the resistance. This is a, a cultural resistance. Education. It comes under education. And uh, I, I was 22 at the time. And we started this. And, uh, and then I, I, I became a firm believer that, I, I mean, I still do is even different circumstances, like landing in the middle of Ashville, which is, you know, Gringoland, and uh, the, there, is, there, is, there is violence there, because violence is, is, you know, it's not just the weapons, violence is the way we organize our societies, is the way we tell people that they are not, they are disenfranchised. There are a lot of white people that are disenfranchised. There's a lot of, I mean, you look around and, you know, it's, it's more than, percent of the planning according the planet according to UN does not say that you know, 99 percent which is true I think there's a lot of people that are out of the system so that's violence the way they eat you know eating at walking to so Walmart is 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 a way of violence a form of violence in my opinion so I think that the way out is not by how do you use the education then how do you use this these things that you they cannot be dogmatic or didactic. Down to its essence, we're educating. Right. And we're educators in its, in its basic essence. In a paideia That's way. what we want to do. It's not even pedagogy, it's paideia. It's, it's something more embracing than, than a pedagogical. Like, because, you, you know, as soon as you say education, people think it's schools, but schools are also an instrument of repression. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you do something that is paideia, like the Greeks thought about education, not like <coughs> The university students are sometimes the first to go. Mexico City, right. Argentina, Chile, yeah. um, um, mm -hmm. Belarus. I want to hear from this gentleman. Uh, <laughs> 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 what can I do for you? <laughs> 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 you quiet number? Uh, you and me would share that. We told <laughs> you. <laughs> 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 We're the introspective members. We told you to talk just a little bit. I believe. Right. I think that, um, you know, I was hanging, we were hanging out with um, some of your students after the show last night. We had a tater tot party at Area <laughs> 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 going crazy with the tater tots. And, uh, Boston <laughs> tater tots. Yeah. Uh, but I was, I was um, really uh, energized by them and, and asking each of them um, outside of the classroom and in the pub where it belongs. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> each of their area of study and the plays that they're writing and interested in. And it, it's, it's kind of like this panel of people that we... And I've been thinking a lot about this being here at Arts Emerson, and particularly in a conversation that we had with David after... We were bracing David, actually, uh, right before we opened, that be ready for some really bad reviews, you know, because we've been getting bad reviews for 10 fucking years. <laughs> With shows just like it that are here, you know. And before I get into that conversation, because I'm actually writing a TCG blog on this one, because it's pretty good and it says a lot about the cultures. If each theater is a culture, and they are, which 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 theaters are inviting and allow you to participate in in the um, definition of what excellence is for a theater, and what theaters are just dead cultures and dead set in their ways and dead and dying, but still they run the game the second we walk in the door. So it's not about getting, a, getting an audience interested in Ferguson or ISIS or all the things we're trying to talk about. It's getting the technicians interested and the donors and the critics and everyone that's reviewing our stuff, right? But last night in, in the uh, extended uh, um, discussion with, with the young ladies and thinking a lot about our work in today's panel, it, it, 
their works are rooted in a social justice, clearly. Okay, women's issues, gender, hopefully culture clash. I think in our 20 year mark, we finally understood what Guillermo Gomez Pena, the performance artist, was warning us that identity politics in your work is a dead end zone. Were we Chicano, were we Hispanic, were we Latino, it wasn't plugging into anyone's worldview. We were stuck in East LA fighting with the other Latino theater company. I'm more <laughs> Chicano than you. And it was a kind of a cannibalism that Lisa Cron talks about in her current research about a feminist piece that she's writing about feminism in New York in the 60s and 70s, you know. But because the work, and when you look at the long view of a group, uh, that the work is, is, is rooted in this, this idea, it, it, and how it relates to being here and even the students that we're engaging in an audience, is this idea of, well, for Culture Clash, we're kind of these blue collar Joes, we're the opposite of divas, we'll come into anyone's theater, work as hard as anyone else, and when we come into a vibrant place like Arts Emerson, where actually all the tech kids are invested in caring about our show because actually they're, they're part designers of our show too. Um, that the experience is, is one of, um, rooted in a kind of ethics, and a kind of principle, guided by some principles. And that's not hoity-toity, it's just the way you really want to work and carry Freedom. yourself. And the way that you want to be presented by producers. Because what's happening in Southern California is a fucking pay-to-play situation, practically. And I'm fucking sick of it. Because you basically, at the big regionals, in a sense, either I'm directing your stuff or you're not here. Or is there enhancement money that you have, you know, or this weird game where it turns out with a kind of a cut and dry Bostonian like Michael Ritchie turns out like, and he's not the perfect artistic director, but it's a kind of a handshake. And you guys want to revisit Chavez Ravine? You know, have at it. Our seventh production is Central Theater Group. And we get criticized from the other side for being a second theater group seven or eight times, I mean, you know, sell out, okay, you play to, you know, Anglo audiences on, on the west side, and, and, and this, that's another kind of a discussion, but I love that we're rooted in that sort of uh, movement, as is so many other people, but there's a ledger that's the, the, the people that have paid the, the price. When we go back and count how many uh, gay men got us involved in theater in San Francisco at that time. How many are not here anymore? Mm -hmm. How many people, um, um, the, the violence along the way and, and, and its many forms, you know? How many poets were incarcerated? <laughs> how many people lost their fucking minds? Um, it's, 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 we're, we're kind of still dealing with a, with a lot of that stuff, but that, 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 that code that we have has nothing to do with best practices or HR, by the way, which we love making fun of. We've actually been conducting ourselves in a way that our maestros and maestras kind of kind of taught us, and we lost a maestra the other night, Daniel Valdez, Luis Valdez's brother. Now, Daniel and Luis really were together very much the core of the other comps. You know, back in the day, Daniel Valdez was everything, along with Socorro Valdez and Diane Rodriguez, and, and so Daniel's wife, well, I think we lost her Sunday night, we got, we got word. And she was very much a maestra, very much involved in the Encuentro um, in Los Angeles. And, and uh, you know, and, and a relatively young lady, you know, but it was that hard artistic life that they led that, of not having health insurance for decades, <laughs> you know. Um, our, our, our teachers continued to kind of pay, pay that price. And I just wanted to remember you all to our meet of uh, she was a great lady, and uh, we lost her way too young. Good night, Los Angeles! We can take a commercial now. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear from <laughs> Or else he's going to keep talking. <laughs> okay, I'll say something. <laughs> Pressure. Uh, well, uh, Stacy um, mentions this. Uh, brought up a sort of a dichotomy recently about sort of response versus, or reaction versus revolution. And I think there is, uh, you can say versus, or you can say and, or or. Um, but I, I, I am sort of interested, uh, I keep thinking about how, I feel like my generation uh, is sort of a threshold generation that needs to really carefully uh, respond and, and, quiet, and whether it's quiet or not quiet, 
I'd say really intentionally create a type of uh, a revolution that comes from culture. Uh, I agree with Carlos. I, and I think a lot about how uh, culture as a container. Um, and this whole, I was thinking about local localization and how, um, for me, and maybe in some ways for Double Edge, uh, sort of um, working, uh, <coughs> Sort of like working on a uh, cellular level, like training and let's say a visceral type of performance experience is working on a cellular level. It's sort of the most uh, pure form of localization. It's sort of in, in, in going inside. And more and more, how you create conditions to go inside um, is a really important, I think, form of, of revolt ultimately, but also creating. Uh, forms of resilience and creativity. Uh, and I, I was looking at the etymology of the word visceral, and it actually really started as uh, talking about the organs. It didn't become figurative until a certain time, and then it stopped being figurative altogether until the 1960s, uh, which I think relates to how rational rationalism <laughs> takes over. So I guess like, a, a culture that's really intentional. I think we're really interested in person-to-person -person experiences. Uh, we really privilege that, and that's not an economical approach. <laughs> that's not an efficient approach, although I think it's efficacious. Um, so I, I am not a founder, uh, although I like to think I uh, found a double edge. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, it was only I was. I mean, I am a student of double edge. I arrived as a, a pupil, as an apprentice, and it was early on. I was deciding what I thought the training was and how people there were getting it wrong, <laughs> inappropriately. <laughs> uh, but I, I honor it, and I think also I am proud to like. Um, I think there is something important about. I just am obsessed with thinking about how you create a culture that thinks about generations. Three or four back and three or four forward. I like how you said the I visceral right. thing. I call it. I yeah, he was right. right. <laughs> <laughs> I call it. I call so the visceral thing, it's so funny. I mean, when you think of the gut, like we always say, right, the, gut feeling. the gut feeling. And I think culture class, we always move from the gut. From the gut, whether we've made those mistakes and we've made some major mistakes. <laughs> but a lot of times we have moved from the gut and the three of us you know, ultimately have the same vision. That's why we're together. Three's a good number, too, for us. And, and we've had other participants in our group, but it's mostly been the three, but that gut feeling, that visceral, the, 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 like you said, the genesis of that. Sometimes you got to move that way and not be conditioned to what an audience needs to hear or what the, the, the board needs to want. <laughs> you got to just do it on your own. The cell idea is so interesting, too, because... Um, you know, we've never operated on a hierarchical thing, even though I think I wrote that play, or no, you wrote that play, or, you know, authorship has been another kind of an issue. We start out truly collective, you know. But even our experience here at Arts Emerson, you know, the janitor is empowered. The janitor's in the show. The guy moving the furniture is in the show. It's his role now. You know, the, um, you know, you've got David and Polly, but, you know, somewhere along the thing, there's a continuum of people that you can pick up the discussion with and say, we're going to need this, or those 30 kids from Roxbury or Hyde Park got to come here, public engagement. You know, it, it moves along in this kind of way that you can get stuff done. You know, I just remember the theaters that we've come from. It's like, well, I've got to go ask Bob, Bob's got to ask Joe, and we'll get back to you by Thursday, you know. In, in that hierarchical structure that, 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 that people hide in, and it just so much gets lost, we get frustrated. And so that cell idea, I mean, the, the Taliban's using that idea, you know, to, the internet uses that idea. I think it's quite brilliant. And, but in, in, the, in, in the theater, in the acting LA world, it's, it's almost the opposite of that, in terms of the star, and the star director, and then the whole, that whole rehearsal process that's ego driven, you know, that's embarrassing stuff. We don't, as, as actors, we don't uh, abide by it.
We have to tell actors to come and join our group for a show. Like, you know, you don't, you can lay your daggers at the door because we're not trying to upstage each other out there. I mean, I, I, I've hardly ever done this, but for some reason, we are stuck in the performance space the whole show. Nobody goes to the dressing rooms. And people are kind of surprised we have dressing rooms. Really. We start there, but we, we're not there. So yeah, I mean, when things get a little quiet for Adelita, the, the, the transgender AIDS worker, or, you know, each of us are in the back. You know, the, the loudest, you know, cheering each other on. I don't remember doing that for so many years. Like, you know, well, that guy's on stage. I'm going to go back, kick back. But no, we're out there kind of rooting each other on and helping each other birth night after night out there on the stage. Kind of fun. Um, I, th I think it's to the credit of, of Arts Emerson and, and the work that um, David and his team are doing. Um, that just personally, I know that we've had you all come to um, work with the High Square Task Force Youth Lexington Community Theater that I work with. And you worked with Boston Arts Academy, and you've been doing this, you know, sort of training generation, right? So it's not just about coming here and being on stage, and even sort of the generation of like, okay, well, we'll talk to some college students or some grad students, and I know we're hoping to also have the youth work with you all um, over their April break. Um, can you talk about that, the, the element of training and community engagement that you've had um, through the work that you do? Well, the very nature of the show was based on interviews uh, from probably pulled from the, like six different plays, like specific plays that we've done: Miami, New York, uh, San Francisco, and other, even Boston. We did uh, we put out a half-hour version of Boston, Radio Boston, whatever. and uh, so just the very nature of interact and you know creating a community to, to create the piece. You know, first you create the community. Then we interview people, and then we create the piece. So the piece was already forming even before it got, you know, got onto the computer. You know? So I think that's, that's one of the uh, these pieces, these pieces that we're connected to the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're approaching through two opposite directions, I think, the community and our, our work, and particularly the Grand Parade, which is um, the Grand Parade explores the 20th century, historically, and memory-wise, um, trying to find out how we can use the 20th century as a way to deal with today. Um, so we've gone through the century and identified things important to us um, or, or that we think need to be mentioned. Um, and, and tracked the century, and also tracked it through um, positive things, because there were a lot of uh, negative things in the 20th century, um, like <laughs> the genocide from 1900 until 2000. Um, so we are dealing with the music and the um, dance through the century and things like that, inventions. So. Um, we are now trying to work with different groups of people on the century. Like we, we are working, we, we just worked in New Orleans. Um, we, we incorporated a jazz singer um, from New Orleans and tried to track the history of jazz as one of the positive things of the century. At the same time, we were, um, we worked with a student group on the history of the century and what they would think was interesting, you know, what they knew about the century and also things that they didn't know about the century that um, would relate to them today. Um, so we're trying to do that all over the place now. And, and the other side to what I think is um, the core of that cell is training with people, um, having people feel alive. Um, and by training, we're talking about physical training and uh, whatever that opens up to, um, imaginative training. So we're really trying to 
feel with people the access of possibilities of culture and imagination um, and just the body being alive instead of being a trash vessel. Um, <laughs> so, it's amazing. That's yeah. a real mentality. Yeah. It's a real life. And, and even today, we were working in Dorchester at the high school there, Jeremiah Burke School, where my grandmother went. Really? Wow. <laughs> and you song. know the it's uh, it's a different reality of like of being hot, you know, like that some of the kids be like I'm I'm hot, <laughs> or I need to move, and I I'm I'm just not used to this. Um, it's almost like the physical atrophy of the rest of the body when the when the focus is right here or here or you know right. the rest of or, the body. Or which is even further, because I remember clearly when I, when I came, see, my memory is very good. When I came in 86, I was coming from an ex a theater experience, <laughs> a theater experience similar uh, to what you guys do, maybe even more formal and really text-driven. And I met Double Edge, and they put me in a room, and they made me train for three hours, and I was 40. That went on and on and on. And it's been like two or three years doing that, with that on, on a weekly basis. And and then it made it something that clicked to me on uh, clicked in, in my brain was one of the things that I re recall also that thinking back back in the seventies is you know they are this has been a, a century of depriving ourselves from our bodies. Because I, you know, I always got kicked out of classrooms, always. I didn't finish the high school. I finished afterward by taking an exam, but I, I was not allowed to do. I was very ADD, and I, I think I am. So, so I couldn't contain myself, and I, and I couldn't, I couldn't sit there for a whole class. I get bored. I still do. So, um, I think that what. Then I started thinking, what they've been doing is they, they, they're trying to train me to be accept the assembly line. And it made more and more sense. You know, this training is training me to be able to sit down and accept orders, receive orders, and deliver some kind of result that is not a detached of meaning to myself, but it's, you know, it means something to the, to the production machine, which I'm not part of. When I came to the village, it blew my mind. It said, this is revolutionary. How can I bring this? to a school like we were today, and we started doing that. But Carlos, that's why they banned Carnival during the dirty work. Yeah, that's true, uh, that's why. they yeah. didn't want people and, to move And together. circus, mm -hmm. and circus. Yeah. They banned circus, kind of Mardi Gras. Uh, they banned mm -hmm. rock and roll. In Argentina. Oh, in Argentina, yeah. yeah. You were not allowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could not. I think they actually did after Katrina, yeah. Katrina oh, really? uh, because But, but I think that the, 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 the inclusion of the body in a way that is not, that where the body takes the lead over the, 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 the speech discourse uh, is sort of like a revolutionary action. And to share that to me and, and have been sharing and to come to do these residencies, we did a training here, right? And what? Well, Katie trained with us. And Kita trained with us. She survived. Kita <laughs> question for you regarding the 20th century, why you think yeah. the 20th century, and why you think 20th century figures are important for the, you know, the young people, the students now. Yeah. Because it's not far away. I mean, we were born, and I was born in the second half of the 20th century. So I remember it very well. You know, we all did it right here, right? Yeah. So, but it seems like if I bring up a name that's only 30 years old, mm -hmm. big name, and no one, you know, the youth don't know who I'm talking about. And that's kind of like, you know, you bring so up I think it, sometimes. but I get resistance saying, no, don't, don't write about the 20th century or figures of the 20th century because, you know, they don't relate. But I see that they do. Yeah, yeah I think it is. Um, and also, um, it's it's probably true well, that feel old people you know. won't know a lot of things. Um, 
Um, and I think that our culture knows less and less, like less things might be passed down or something like that. Like I think I know more about my history than a lot of people Depends today yeah, do. Depends on the family but, um, I think but why um, did you pick we the did the century? Odyssey uh, a couple of years back as uh, one of our spectacles. and. Uh, we were nervous about it because it's all about, it's an anti, basic anti-war uh, novel. Uh, <laughs> and um, Carlos was giving a text that was about how it was his, he was Odysseus, it was his fault that all of his men and all these people died. Um, he, like, it was a, it's a poem mm -hmm. that he was saying. And we were very nervous about that with the kids. Um, and, and it was really pretty mind-blowing because it, it really spoke to everyone. And we, we wanted to do something that would address all of today's situations, but in a more mythological way. Mm -hmm. So we thought, um, like the Odyssey was written you know, 500 yeah. years after that Trojan War happened, so we would write about the 20th century. The, theme, um, the universal themes are still different. Yeah, and then we, we started doing it, and we weren't really thinking about the fact how much war there was, or like, really, there, it was, when you look at it all together in our, our show's an hour, um, <laughs> it's, a, it's so intense. Uh, so we just, you know, can't have brought ourselves to the brink of extinction in this one small period of time. Um, so <coughs> we were trying to figure out how do we relate, how do we, though, get people to understand it. Um, we got to um, Franklin Roosevelt's fireside chat um, about the stock market crash, mm -hmm. and he his text was almost identical to what was said after the economic uh, crash. Um, and so we started tracking that, like what could we pick up that was this is the same now. And it's all the same. Cyclical, So it's like, we're talking about Vietnam as something that's happening today, only, you know, it's Iraq. Yeah. Uh, or it's, you know, Fifty other million places. Um, so we're trying to do it like that, so they will recognize images that they might identify with today. I think it's so interesting too, though, just in terms of education in this country, because you know, as we've seen happen in places like Arizona, when you basically tell the people you can't teach your children and the rest of their peers about the history of um, Chicanos or African Americans or Native Americans by you know, purging ethnic studies, and, and what a danger that you know potentially could be, and the and the, the textbook sort of like Germany in thirty seven exactly, <laughs> but the, but the, also the textbooks, the textbook companies who respond to we need to you know include Cesar Chavez in history, and they say mm, there's just no room, they're, they're so chock full of history, <laughs> and then also sort of the, the strategy being like, but if we get rid of slavery. And which is a technique that some of the textbooks want to, you know, if we get rid of that, we can add a lot more. So let's, you know, let's maybe clean up, but, you know, who, whose history gets told and who's 20th century, you know, because so much of the 20th century, too, is the story of immigrants who are here because of the, the realities in their own countries that it's impossible. That specific case you mentioned in Arizona, um, are one of our books was named in the affidavit um, along with Shakespeare, and yeah, and, and the and the other side of that fight is the Koch brothers and the Tea Party. That's who exactly. the school superintendent, right. exactly, uh, who later became the attorney general of the state. That's who they're funding. And on the other side, three teachers that got dragged all the way up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, hundreds of thousands of dollars of legal bills. A judge threw it out finally, but ethnic studies has evaporated. You know, no one, no one was the teachers, the the. Uh, 
the, the workers weren't there to re to re institute it into the into the curriculum. Right. So and what you're doing, you're right. putting you're putting these things together, right? Like the Koch brothers and, and these policies. And you know, back this is what I'm saying. Back in the eighties there was this thing that if you were saying those things like this, you were you know, it's a conspiracy theory. But it is not actually. <laughs> it is not. It's actually it's happening. Yeah, look at what's happening with it. I mean, all this thing of uh, Roosevelt and the banks. The banks are writing the script for Obama now, or for whoever is in the in the, in the Treasury office. They have the script. It's being said. It, 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 we can look. I mean, how is this transfer? Because what is happening is that there is a transfer of, of funds. The funds from the people that work go to the bankers. This is, you can look at it. I mean, the United Nations has a study. It's not like I'm saying it. Yeah, it's not a conspiracy. Right. So, so the, the money that is being produced by everybody goes through the hands of a 1%. This is not a... a, a More than ever. Exactly. That's violence and what violence is in my opinion, is the, su the suppression of justice. Okay. When justice... And culture and, and education. Culture. Yeah, and culture. So you su and then, of course, these things are going to happen. Absolutely. Monsanto and the food, and the food mm -hmm. industry. You said something that I'm, I'm interested for the three of the Culture Clash guys of a certain you know, age and how cut off from our bodies. You know, I just remember early Teatro Campesino as we were all each members at different times in our lives, but you know, Luis and the Capucino really put you through the paces. The bank de pasos, the twenty million steps. I mean, it was it was like no talking for you know. There's no need to just you know. And I'm and I'm in the work in the work. So Luis bought this. But what's the twenty? The bank de pasos. It, it was it's, it's an, an exercise. It's an exercise. It's, it's, an exercise. it's a very rudimentary uh, native. Aztec, Dimish, Ik, Akbar, Ganchi, Chandra, all um, uh, Nahuatl words and representations. Of Physicality, the, the sphere, the movement, the mind, family relationship, all, right, and all, all these things. Things. And, and yeah, and then you do exercise. That sounds awesome. Yeah. But, but anyway, <laughs> no, yeah, getting, getting, getting back in touch with, because with, I'm interested in the work, how, you know, when we are laid bare, how simple uh, things can be. Um, how simple um, Aristophanes can be, very, very kind of primal and, and getting into that. So what we need is a big, fat uh, New England Arts Council grant to come to Double Edge Space in Western UMass. And it would be fun, and you could root it academically here at Arts Center. <laughs> <laughs> big pitch, big pitch coming. David. But, but, I think but it would be an expeditions grant from me. <laughs> <laughs> but, but not but in the winter. Rich. Not yeah, in the winter. Not in the winter. I'm sorry, next week we need to go to LA in the winter. Oh, there you go. <laughs> they need to go to LA. It's not just getting culture class back in shape, it's working in the Arts Center. Yeah, but I think it's like a culture class getting in Doing the original the work in the Mayan Riviera. Uh, and, and the For the 20th oh. century. I'll have to get a swimsuit. Me and Carlos will be hanging out by the daiquiri. The daiquiri. Bueno, nos cogió la noche. It is 5 o'clock. Oh, we're in our half hour. Hey, real quick. Each of your students said something really wonderful about you. And you're carrying yourself as an academic and an ethical principle. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank a lot you. of you are here. I mean, we... We poke fun at academia. We come from a weird area. Like my dad was a professor. You know, my parents were both educators. We need it. It's symbiotic. You know, we kind of need. We get to operate outside of it. You know, but we're here and we want to be here. And it's been a, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Drinks on the patio. It's cocktail hour. Or as we say, it's half.